Hey, good morning. My name is Jamie Marcus, and I'm a past president of the Wyoming Library Association, and I'm also the Wyoming State Librarian. It is my pleasure this morning to introduce Bob Beck as our morning keynote speaker. Most of you probably already know or are familiar with Mr. Beck. He is something of a Wyoming institution. <laughs> Bob is news director for Wyoming Public Radio and has been since 1988. During those 28 years, Bob has won almost 100 national, regional, and state news reports. He has been honored by the Governor's Council on Impaired Driving for his reporting, and he was also the voice of an Emmy Award-winning documentary on the subject of memory. Those are just two of the awards bestowed upon Bob, and unfortunately we don't have sufficient time this morning to go over all the accolades he has. Bob has covered the Wyoming legislature longer than any other broadcaster in the state, and is often a political guest and host on Wyoming PBS. Mr. Beck taught broadcast news at the University of Wyoming for 20 years, and his 1998 television reporting class won a regional Emmy for reporting excellence. On a personal level, Bob is very active in community events and has co-chaired United Way campaigns with his wife, Deborah. He earned a Bachelor of Science in Radio Television from Southern Illinois University and is an Illinois native. We won't hold that against him. <laughs> I'm guessing he's extremely excited this morning, not only because of his appearance here with us, but because the Cubs won last night. <laughs> he's a pretty big fan. So without thir further ado, I give you Mr. Bob Beck. Thank you very much, Mary. I appreciate uh, people being here. We have a huge audience here in Cheyenne, and nice to talk to you all across the state. Um, you know, I, I know to get me here, you had to have about 20 or 30 people turn you down, and I appreciate uh, still being on the list, so thank you very much for that. Um, I thought we would start uh, just with the theme of the day and talk a little bit about libraries and uh, their importance in my young life. Uh, I actually spent quite a bit of time at libraries uh, in my hometown of Wheaton, Illinois, uh, the Wheaton Public Library. I'll give it a shout out. Story time was a big deal for me uh, when I was in the uh, kindergarten through third grade uh, range. I also uh, spent a lot of time there just uh, you know, enjoying the scene. It was a great place to uh, escape, uh, a place certainly for enlightenment. Uh, and here's something I'll, I'll just throw out. I, I met not one, but two, my first two serious girlfriends uh, were made in libraries. And one of the things that's interesting is I, the library also provides a lot of information on what to do on those dates. So uh, I uh, <laughs> won't go into those details, but that was helpful. And, uh, and so it's worked out, I eventually, to get married. So that's, uh, that's a useful thing. Um, but the thing that I would like to mention that libraries are just so important to a lot of us and I know a lot of you are struggling right now with financial difficulties I understand that uh, more than you know and uh, it's I, I would hope that maybe there's a way we can all find a solution to deal uh, with some of the difficulties uh, so maybe it's sometimes better uh, not to replace a, a police car or two so we can shift a couple of bucks uh, towards our county libraries because they're so important to kids and even especially in this day and age I think with uh, technology and that sort of thing you do need to get back to the basics and, and libraries just provide so much and, and you're doing a lot more. I've uh, spent a lot of time at uh, libraries, I wrote them down so I wouldn't forget, but in Laramie, Cheyenne, Sheridan, Casper, Riverton, Lander, and Jackson, I have filed stories from a number of these places. Uh, thank you for your Wi-Fi and the opportunity <laughs> to use it. And uh, They're just a very important place. We've done a number of public discussions uh, through the radio station at public libraries and, and I've attended many of those and so they're just so important to our communities and uh, I know sometimes as politicians make uh, difficult decisions uh, sometimes they don't uh, find that to be as important as some other things and I would disagree because I think a, a well-read and a well-educated uh, uh, citizen a group of citizens is very important and I think we're learning that during this election season so it's not a, a bad thing to have smart people and, and people who are learning things so I assume you're all applauding out there so I'll, uh, I'll accept that so thank you very much no, uh, but I, I do think funding for libraries is essential in fact it's funny I was thinking about this driving over today I covered a 
uh, it was it was the Laramie City Council and the county commissioners in Albany County were having a budget discussion one year. This was probably about 25 years ago, and uh, they didn't want to give extra money. In fact, wanted to get a little less to our our local library, and one of the members, uh, I think it was the city council, said, you know, I never went to the library, said it exactly that way, <laughs> I never went to the library when I was a kid, so I don't know that it matters to anyone. And one of the county commissioners said, well, that sold me. I'm, I'm supporting <laughs> it. So that, there you go. So it's a funny conversation that you hear all the time. I also know why a lot of you have become librarians, and I never really understood I figured you just like to shush people like me that come in and are too loud and things like that. And I certainly had my share of that um, in, in various libraries, not in this state, so that's why I had to move here. But uh, they um, go to, I, I have friends that work at the University of Wyoming Library, and they come back, or they have these photos of these stacks of books that they get to bring back that are all free from all these people. So now. I realized that maybe I failed, and I should have looked at the, uh, becoming a librarian so I could get free stuff. So that's uh, really, and I'm about free stuff, so that's great. Um, we're going to talk about a, a couple things. We want to talk a little bit about the station, of course, and in what we do. Um, wanted to, uh, I've been asked to talk a little bit about the election season, um, maybe localize it a little bit for you, and then I've been asked to maybe talk a little bit about the upcoming legislative session. So I thought we could touch on all those. Um, I'm on Twitter under the name Butter Bob, um, and I can explain that at some point. But uh, um, and I actually do see that my friend Kaisa uh, has uh, actually she's one of those people that comes home with free books has uh, said hello. So um, if you do have a question at any point, just put the hashtag question on Twitter, and that will be a way we can address. Uh, questions across the state, and of course those of you in the room, um, just feel free to ask and I'll repeat the question so we can all hear it uh, where, no matter where we are. But uh, I want to talk a little bit about Wyoming Public Radio. I started there in 1988 when it was sort of a student plaything, and uh, I was the professional in the newsroom, and we had three or four interns. Uh, three or four, I must say, fabulous interns that have gone on to do some very amazing things. Uh, in my time, uh, boy, we have attorneys, we have broadcasters, we have uh, uh, people who have been uh, become major press secretaries for um, Senator Barrasso and Senator Simpson, and, and so we've had uh, people who have gone on to do some great things that have come through our newsroom, and it's uh, very exciting. Some of our reporters have gone on uh, to do a, a number of great things that you can still hear many of them on the network who have gone on to bigger stations in the public radio system and uh, we've got one in Boston, one in Chicago, one that actually is on the network quite a bit, Peter O'Dowd. Uh, we have uh, Molly Messick who is involved in a very important uh, and very interesting podcast called Gimlet. Uh, we have a woman who worked for me, Addie Goss, who has uh, just become a doctor. Uh, she covered in Wyoming with me a series on rural medicine and the lack of doctors, and she uh, has decided, well, maybe I'll become one. And she went to medical school, and she spent the last decade, it seems like, uh, trying to get that resolved, and so she is um, finishing up things, and uh, so it's very exciting to, to watch her actually do something about a problem, and unlike the rest of us that just talk about it. So, that's, uh, so we've had a lot of exciting people come through there. As, as mentioned earlier, I've been there for 28 of the 50 years, and I was, uh, I think we had five full-time professional people at the radio station when I started. I don't actually know how much, it would been nice if I had looked that fact out, but I think it's probably in the 20 range of people now. In my newsroom, uh, we have, uh, if you count me, seven of us. Uh, that report the news uh, where it was, as I said, we, uh, we added our first full-time person in 1992 uh, in addition to me, and uh, we've had a couple um, which we're able to slowly add, and most recently uh, we've been able to add positions mainly because we've gotten uh, some funders who have helped us uh, 
cover such important things as education, um, certainly energy and the environment, uh, as, uh, as well as some other topics. So uh, we've, we're, we have a woman who's been focused on uh, a number of women's issues lately, and she's been looking at the elections. And she's also our Morning Edition host, uh, Caroline Ballard, who I hope you all enjoy. Uh, we're just so impressed and proud of the work she's doing. Uh, it was funny, I was driving over here too, and I heard a story on NPR about women in newsrooms uh, back in the day. I don't know if you all caught that, but um, th th that's changed. Um, I'm the guy that gets pushed around in the newsroom and, and not the women, because right at the second, we have all women uh, in my newsroom. And uh, so um, it's, it's, it's rough for me. A lot of times I go home crying. So uh, it's, uh, but they're delightful and they're hardworking and uh, it's just very fun to be in a situation like this. Um, this is the 50th year of the station. Uh, the station has uh, just done some remarkable things since I first knew it. We were kind of a hodgepodge of programming when I first started there, and we've been able to become more focused. We've added some stations, uh, again, thanks to some really good fundraising and that sort of thing. And uh, uh, because we're a rural state, we get some grants from the Corporation for Public Broadcasting. And so when you hear people say evil things, uh, sometimes members of our congressional delegation say some mean things about the Corporation for Public Broadcasting, uh, do know that it's one of the reasons that we can get to places like Jackson, get to places like Gillette, uh, Casper, that kind of thing. The reason that our signals have grown is, is courtesy of the CPB and uh, their help in getting smaller stations like ours started. So uh, that's been important. Station is, uh, when I first covered the legislature, I had worked at a commercial station in Laramie, and I remember going in 88, and people said, oh, you're that campus station. You're, you're the campus station. And, and, or, or it was, you're with who? And I had to explain what we did. And that, that, that stayed that way for about five or six years. Um, now, I had an incident a couple of years ago where uh, there was a legislator that I didn't interview a lot. Uh, I, I hadn't had really much of a relationship with him, but he was perfect for a story I was working on. He's very conservative from Gillette. And I had him come out for an interview. He had to go in and vote. And then he came back out to talk to me. And he said, by the way, Bob, is, is this for open spaces? And I was surprised, and I said, well, well, yes, it is. It's the story I'm doing. And he goes, oh, love that show. We listen every week. Uh, my wife and I listen as we come home from church, and we contribute to the station. OK, this is a very conservative person that I would not think knew where NPR was. So I was excited to hear uh, that he was a contributor. And so that told me that things have changed a little bit. Uh, people do are aware of who we are. Uh, with people like Liz Cheney that I think uh, realize it's a good idea to do interviews with us and, and, and be on the air. So um, it's it's been a lot of fun. Uh, this The importance to the state, uh, I, I think, is I, I meet people all the time who grew up in places like Newcastle and Sundance and Pinedale and no matter where it is or even smaller places. And you know we've been a lifeline to them, and, and uh, we understand that, and we're very humbled, and we're very proud of what we do. Uh, this is another anniversary that 10 years ago, I had decided that we really weren't doing a very good job of presenting long-form reporting uh, to the state. And it had bothered me. It had bothered me for a couple of years. And I listened to what, and, and part of it was resources. We had three people at that time. And I sat down with my new staff at the time, actually it was four people when we did this, and I said, you know, I've got this thought of how we can do this, but it's going to require us to do a little less over here in the newscast area, but do a lot more in the feature reporting area, and we came up with open spaces. Um, the idea was we wanted a show where we could do not only interviews, we had an interview program that we did every night, but that, that took a lot of time and effort, and so we wanted, but, but it wasn't well done, and I was never happy with it. And so we thought, well, what if we put together an hour program, we had to pick a day, we picked Fridays for whatever reason, and then we started to repeat it after that, and just see if we can do feature reporting as well as uh, compelling interviews and, and make it all pretty much about Wyoming and the region. 
and that's what we decided to do, and that was 10 years ago on the show's Open Spaces. Um, if you've never heard it, we invite you to listen to it. It's available on podcast and, and gets streamed at wyomingpublicmedia.org. And uh, that has been a game changer as far as our newsroom is concerned, because when we did that, it allowed us to focus on doing more longer form pieces. Uh, that has led to a lot of those awards that we've won. It's been a remarkable run. The show itself has won eight national awards, uh, which is pretty amazing when you consider the first national award we had ever won was in 2003. And so since 2006, uh, the show itself has won eight. It's won nine Edward. We've had nine stories that have appeared on that show that have won Edward R. Murrow Awards. I don't think if I'm, I may be wrong about this, but I don't think anybody in the state has ever won more than three in the state's history. So uh, we're very excited about that. We've also won a number of other national awards for stories that have appeared on that. And so it's it worked out, I would say, and it's been a uh, a very exciting show to work on. We can gear towards our audience. Uh, we talk a lot about all of us in public radio do this because they train us all the same way. But uh, our audience is the most important thing. You know, so will our audience understand the story? Will they care about this story? Uh, but we, following the theme of open spaces, our goal is to give you a lot of things. I think at first everybody thought it was an environmental show, <laughs> just with the name of it. But our, and and there's a funny story behind the title. We sat for weeks trying to come up with what we were going to call this thing. We had no idea it was going to be Wyoming matters, Wyoming something or other. And and we were all there. And one day we were we were describing it, and we wanted a bunch of different topics in an hour much like All Things Considered, actually. And and that was really our working title was Wyoming All Things Considered, which we have stunk. And nobody would have remembered it or anything like that. And so we didn't do it. Um, we even had the theme music before we had the name of the, uh, of the show, and, which is odd. But we had a reporter came in and said, let's, and this was in early November, let's call it Open Spaces. And which is perfect because it, it talks about Wyoming. And then it talks about the wide range of topics we wanted to present. And we were really excited. We did a pro, we, we did some advertising, we did a prototypical show. We, did, we wanted to see what does it sound like. And we made several tweaks to it. We worked on this thing for several months. We started in, I think, September and finally got it ready to go in the end of December. And it debuted that following January. Um, Right around, like two weeks before it was to go on the air, the Casper Star Tribune came out with a new section, and it was called Open Spaces, and we could not believe it. And uh, we already had got a logo, <laughs> we had already come up with a name, and we panicked, and we said, oh, the hell with them. We'll just have our name, and they can have theirs. And so I get asked about that every now and then. I did call the editor, who at the time was my friend Chad Baldwin, and I said, we are not stealing your name. We had we already had it, and so we all both got a good laugh out of it, and nobody cares. So um, we, we've just moved on. So I, ours does better. But uh, anyhow, um, <laughs> that's what we were doing. But our goal is to focus on our audience with important things. We just encourage people to constantly contact us. And so, uh, you know, if you've got great story ideas for that show, we, we'd like to talk about them. Um, I'm a former, uh, probably I'll go back on at some point, but I'm a former public radio news director association board member, uh, a national board member. Yeah, and I can just tell you in our system, the dedication to what we do is, it would make everybody proud. Uh, you know, it's a... Uh, it's an interesting landscape. Uh, a lot has changed. There was some thought that radio might disappear uh, over the air, that nobody was going to listen. There's going to be satellite challenges. There's internet challenges, certainly. Uh, and I'm as bad as anybody. Uh, you know, there's there's all kinds of podcasts you can listen to on iTunes and music. And so, will anybody listen to the radio? And so, we had to change. And uh, what what happened was public radio really stepped up in, in our station. Uh, a lot of credit to Micah Schweitzer at my station for uh, really getting us in the right direction there uh, for developing podcasts. And uh, we have developed one in particular that uh, has also just recently won a national award uh, called Human Nature. 
If you've not had an opportunity to listen to it or if you're not a podcast person, let me make my plug for human nature. It's about people and their encounters with nature. And so if you've had, a, and we're always looking for ideas, but we've had stories about uh, people getting chased by bears and, 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 and wolves and, and, you know, a guy was using pigeons to send notes across a river and then the pigeons all disappeared one day because some guy had put something up and they weren't to eat it. And, and so it was, uh, we've had very interesting stories and very interesting feedback. Ira Glass mentioned it at a recent speech he gave uh, at a national conference. And so it's getting lots of attention. Our host, Caroline Ballard, um, they decided that she should do interviews without knowing anything uh, about the topic. <laughs> so she just sits people down and interviews them. And she can, so the person, so you had an encounter with a bear. Tell me about it. And, and that's all she knows. And so there's no pre-interviewing. And, uh, uh, and then they produce it. And it's very fun. You know, it's a very interesting approach. And, uh, and it's probably where a lot of public radio is headed. So you want the traditional news. You want the traditional stuff. You enjoy the entertainment programs. But there's this other element that really has appealed to our younger audience, uh, which, uh, you know, we're, we're, when we say younger in public radio, it's under 40, but um, actually under 50 in some respects. But uh, you know, those kids, the 48-year-olds, <laughs> they're trouble. Uh, but we're, we're trying to reach more of those folks, and so uh, that's what we're um, focused on. And so that's what you can expect. We're, we're doing a lot more with multi-platform reporting. I just hired her a couple of reporters, and you know that's the question. Uh, do you know how to work with the web? Do you know how to work with video? What What are you going to do that's different and exciting? And you know, for an old guy like me, uh, it used to be for the first 20 years of my career, you used a tape recorder, and then you went back and put stuff on a reel to reel, and you got a razor blade, and you wax stuff up, and that's how you put it together. I've had reporters ask me, Bob, did you ever have to use a razor blade? And I said, Yes. Well, you know, so I, this apparently means I'm super old, which I am, but I try not to, uh, you know, think about it, but they're kind enough to remind me. The uh, technology we have now, I, I could interview somebody here, write it on this phone, there's a microphone that's fabulous on this, and, and I could send it, I can voice it here, and I have an editing piece of equipment on this, and I'll be able to send it back to the station and report, and it's an incredible way we send things. I do things from the legislature that you know, almost make me cry. I used to send audio interviews or, or tape bites by unscrewing a phone and taking a, what we call them alligator clips, and you clipped it onto that, and then you pushed your recorder, and that's how you sent tape. Now, not only could you send audio by email, but we also have ways we can just download it into our system from remotely. I can also talk into a little box, uh, much like this. It digitizes my voice, and it sounds like I'm in the studio. And so we can do all these things. We can even get people. It, it's been a little harder with some public officials than others, but uh, we are uh, teaching some of our public officials how to talk into their own phone, and then we can interview them on the phone. They can send the tape to us, and we can mix it together. It's it's just the coolest thing ever. And uh, of course, these people that work for me, these young people, uh, they've known how to do it all the time. But uh, and frequently, the boss gets, "Could you? I'm having an old guy moment. Can you show me how to do this?" And oh, click that. Oh, okay. Thank you very much. But they're very good at it. Um, just a couple of extra thoughts about the station, where we're heading. We are really looking forward to upping and doing some different and unique things with education reporting in the coming year. Uh, have a new reporter who's just got a fabulous background in investigative journalism, and uh, she's done. Uh, she worked on a podcast, in fact, called Reveal. Uh, that has gotten a lot of national attention, and she's going to start working for us in December. And she's done a lot with youth radio, and what's exciting about that is we're hopefully going to train some young aspiring journalists in schools across the state to do a little reporting for us on their education experience, uh, possibly on the reservation as well. So we're looking forward to maybe doing that and, and, and stepping things up. Um, just real quick, and before I change, Topics and see again if you have a question, just hit hashtag question 
and I will try and address it for you. Um, let's talk a little bit about this election season. Uh, you've heard a lot about the national election. Uh, what's going on in Wyoming? Well, of course, we have a congressional race uh, to replace uh, Representative Lummis, and uh, just saw some polling numbers that were about what I suspected, uh, that uh, Liz Cheney seems to be the front runner. And then Ryan Green, who has been an excellent candidate, uh, is uh, probably going to fall short. And anything can happen between now and Election Day. But I think she might need to create a scandal or something. And I really don't suspect that will happen. Um, <coughs> what What would um, Liz Cheney bring to the table? Uh, I'm sure a lot of people are interested. I, I don't find her to be like her father at all. Uh, I covered him uh, back in the day. I find her to be very much more conservative uh, than he is, actually, and uh, especially when it comes to maybe some social issues and, and that type of thing. I don't recall Jenny ever uh, getting involved in topics like that. She's been a little more willing. Uh, I was listening to her. I, te I could tease her, I think, and say that, uh, you know, really the Obama administration is not the reason the Cubs took so long to get to the World Series. But if you listen to her long enough, you, you might actually think that's the case. So um, will she be working with other people um, early on? I'm not sure she will, but we'll wait and see and monitor that. People do say things in campaigns uh, that are they're saying in campaign season that don't necessarily come true. But I, I think you will find somebody, though, initially that, that could um, you know, she's going to represent the state. We'll all keep an eye on her. I, I know there's plenty of Republicans out there that are suspicious of her, uh, that didn't necessarily like how this all went down. But but at the same time, I have found her to be extremely intelligent. I have found her to be um, actually quite charming. Um, and I have found her to be, <laughs> um, she's tough. And so, you know, we'll see how that goes. Had, if Ryan Green was to spring the upset, I think you're looking at a guy who, uh, boy, he's going to work hard for the state because, as he said in the debate the other night, you can you can get rid of me pretty darn quickly. So um, you know that's the the life of a Democrat. But I don't think this will be the last we see of Ryan Green. I think he's been an excellent candidate. I, I just think it probably would have helped him to have been in a campaign before this, maybe in the legislative side of things. And years ago, Chris Rothfuss ran against Senator Enzi. Uh, and Chris is a Democrat from our town, is the state senator, and, and just a really a terrific state senator. Um, senator Enzi convinced him to run for the legislature. He was so impressed with him. And uh, Chris has done that. And I wouldn't be real surprised down the line if Chris takes a peek at a federal office or a state office of, of some note. And I think he's the kind of person that can win uh, because they're very similar people. And Ryan, I think, reminds me politically of, of Governor Friedenthal. Uh, a little more down the middle, and uh, and I think that uh, that's sort of that's something that could play in the state. But uh, boy, it's tough for people to push that D uh, sometimes on these elections. So we'll see how that goes. Uh, I think the thing to look in the long term is what happens with Representative Lummis. I suspect she's going to run for governor unless something changes in her personal life. Uh, that has been what she's really wanted to do for a number of years. Uh, and so uh, she's looking forward to coming back to the state and uh, getting away from Washington. I know the climate out there has been hard on her. And so she's looking forward. I think Ed Murray uh, has been certainly positioning himself to run for governor as well. So we might have a very interesting Republican uh, primary. I'm not hearing names yet of Democrats who are looking at that race, but uh, those will probably come in due time. I, I do think they would quickly get that position back. And so, um, and there are some tremendous young Democrats in the state that are up and coming. Um, probably more will be coming because I think the Bernie Sanders campaign, uh, what we saw at least in Laramie and what I'm hearing people saw across the state is that actually brought more people into politics. And, and so I think there's going to be more voters uh, out there and so that will be interesting. The thing I'm watching in the legislature, we, we didn't think we would have a very exciting primary campaign and then things changed. Uh, the woman who is to be our Speaker of the House, Rosie Berger, lost a race in uh, Sheridan and that has thrown everything into turmoil. I, I know our minority floor leader currently in the House of Representatives also is facing a very difficult race here in Cheyenne. And so that could really change things. You, you really could be losing, because Tim Stepson stepped down, 
uh, you've lost Rosie Berger, and, and then you might lose your ranking Democrat uh, as well, and there will be a void of leadership. There's no question about that, and, and that'll be in the House of Representatives, but trust me, you really want leadership. And so it, it's going to be a, uh, something to watch. Uh, there's two people that are trying to become speaker. One is Steve Harshman. Uh, he is uh, the football coach in Toronto County High School, and uh, so, of course, an educator. And he is, has been the Appropriations Committee chair. Uh, he would probably look to slide up at the very least uh, as the majority floor leader in the House. Um, Steve, you know, fiscal conservative, but it's been, yeah, I don't know. He, he goes back and forth between right and moderate. Uh, from time to time, but I would generally throw them in that moderate category. And then David Miller, who is a representative from Riverton, uh, David is uh, is conservative, and uh, certainly in a lot of ways, except uh, when it comes to social issues. He's a very strong libertarian and uh, doesn't like government involved in a lot of things, and uh, so he could be intriguing uh, if he gets in. Uh, he is one of the foremost experts in the nation, in the world, as a matter of fact, on uranium. And uh, which is interesting, and uh, I, I figured, well, maybe there's two David Millers, but there's not. I looked it up and thought, oh, that was actually him. So uh, he's he's got some interesting thoughts on some topics, but uh, we'll we'll see how that plays out. Uh, but I think the, there's going to be some other turnover in the House of Representatives. We might see a few more Democrats actually at the end of the day over there, and there's going to be a couple of more Democrats at least in the Senate. It looks like. And uh, there's one race I'm watching very closely, the Escabel Ellis race here, that I think is going to be extremely tight. Um, you know, certainly you could see somebody holding that Democratic seat, but uh, uh, if Afi Ellis was to win that race, she brings a lot of interesting things to the table. She's a Native American and uh, a woman in the Republican Party in the Senate. That would be new. And so we're looking forward to uh, maybe some different perspectives there. So I think that that would be. Uh, those are a couple of races that we're watching. We've got Couple and Laramie that uh, we'll see how they, they come out and whether or not they're, they're um, uh, as competitive as I think they're going to be. And I know that there's some other races. Uh, we're, we're going back to that Rosie Berger district. Can uh, uh, the Democrat Hollis Hackman win that race? Uh, so there's, there's a lot of intrigue, I think, for us here in the state. And uh, it'll be reflected by if you elect a bunch of conservative people, that you know you're going to see more budget cuts, I think. And if you and uh, in if if you, but I think at the end of the day, new people, it's a problem walking into this budget with a lot of new folks. Um, and I think it could be 20 some new folks in the House of Representatives. You didn't run on raising taxes. I'm here to tell you. So I wouldn't look for anybody to pass anything this coming session. Uh, and maybe even the one after that. And so if you're looking for new revenue to come into the state, it would have to be through economic development. It will have to be through the energy industry turning around. And so and will there be more budget cuts? Governor is asking them to use the rainy day account. Uh, I think there's an opportunity that um, you'll see both. You'll see some money on the rainy day account, but it, would it be $100 million? No, I don't think they'll do that. I, I think they'll be very frugal. And I think that uh, they could shift money from some other sources. We have a lot of income that comes from other places. I think that's there's an opportunity for that. Could you use some one-time money to, to fill some of this void? You could. Uh, we'll just see what the philosophy is. But a lot of people who have stopped things like that from happening, some of that creativity, have actually left the legislature. And so uh, I think Phil Nicholas was one of those people that maybe would have stopped some of that from happening. He's gone. And so we'll see what kind of changes that means in the Senate. I don't know that Eli Bebout's uh, going to be much different in that regard, but we'll watch. Will we get Medicaid expansion? No, um, I don't think. I, I think that would be a surprise. But, you know, they really missed the boat in the last couple of years if you were looking for that revenue piece as well as the uh, health care piece. So it doesn't sound like that's happening. You might see some work on uh, removing exemptions from taxes and uh, – I think we could see some more social issues crop up uh, this session, which are always a treat, and uh, we'll, we'll see how those play into things. Uh, interesting discussions on what to do with funding for education. 
uh, that is a biggie. And remember that the state of Wyoming is 0-7, I think, lifetime uh, against educators when it comes to uh, going to court on funding issues. And uh, so I would be very careful uh, if I was the legislature about cutting them anymore. Uh, University of Wyoming has taken some major cuts. Uh, there's a lot of uh, concerns on campus about that. Some it's turned into a little bit of a battle of academics versus athletics, uh, you know, where I come from. So we'll be certainly watching that issue. Local government, uh, that's a tough one. And, and I know it's one you all have to be very concerned about because there's a chance there could be some additional reductions in that area as opposed to more money. And so we'll see, we'll see what happens. Um, Shelley Simonton has been lobbying her fanny off to try and uh, get maybe some more revenue just for local government, and if that happens, I think that would be good news for the libraries. But uh, if it doesn't happen, and if they continue to trend downward with revenue, you know, like a, some of these smaller tax bases like Albany County and Niobrara County and, and other places, it's going to be tough. And so we'll just wait and see what, what that happens there. So I think that's going to be. And then corrections is also another issue. Yeah? I have a question about the state giving counties in particular more responsibilities that the state used to take care of and now we will be expecting the counties to. Do you think there might be some trends with that as well? The question was, uh, do you think that since the state has asked counties to pick up some of the responsibilities that the state used to pick up, will that continue? Yeah, uh, maybe. <laughs> uh, you need legislators to point that out. Uh, to people. And so uh, I think uh, one area that I uh, have seen, what was, there was a funny story, that, not funny in the least, but odd to say, uh, corrections thought that they didn't have to do any more mental health services. And that was a place they could cut. And they'll just throw them to the community mental health uh, places across the state, those agencies. Well, they didn't realize that they had also suffered about, in fact, mental health agencies, as a lot of folks might know, uh, I've known this because of my work with United Way in Albany County, have suffered some massive cuts. And it's, it's a challenge for them to see the people that really, really need help and can't afford it. And uh, so they said, well, we can't help you. And so suddenly we're in a situation where corrections might be letting some people out without mental health services. I don't know how you feel about that, but I'm more, a little concerned about that. I'd like to know who's moving now into my neighborhood even more so than uh, some of the people, but um, it's a concern, and I do think that there's a chance that they will throw some of that on counties, but I also think that, you know, Pete, who does the lobbying for that group, is very good, and uh, there's a chance that his dad might get elected to the legislature, too, so that would help him uh, send that message. So we'll, we'll watch that very closely, but, yeah, I do think there's a chance that uh, everybody wants the other guy to do it for them, and I think that that's a chance that uh, those kinds of things might happen. So, again, if you have any other questions or anything else, let's see. Um, oh, here's one. Uh, do you think Liz will truly represent Wyoming, or well, she brought Vermont, but I think she meant Virginia. Um, well, I think, uh, yeah, I think she'll be fine. Um, I think that, uh, you know, she's in her campaign, from what I've seen, she's been to a lot of the smaller towns in the state. She's been all across the state. Um, the, only, the only thing I wonder about her is she wants to be very hardline on a lot of things. And so I wonder, will she, you know, how long will that take till she realizes if you want to get something accomplished, you've got to work across the aisle. And boy, Congress has been absolutely atrocious at working across the aisle. I will say that's the great thing about the Wyoming legislature is they do work across the aisle. It's not necessarily about party here. It's more about the issue and your background. So it's the ag folks against the energy folks. It's uh, you know, those kinds of things that you see more here than anything else. So it's, a, it's an unusual legislature in that respect. But um, yeah, I, I, I don't know why she wouldn't. She would, and again, it's, it's actually not that hard to replace members of Congress, you just have to show up and vote. And so if you, if you scare them with a close election or something, it's amazing how quickly they come around. Malcolm Wallet won by just a few hundred votes one time in a re-election. And uh, I saw some changes uh, in, the, in the way he operated. So, you know, they, they can get a little arrogant, but, uh, you know, you have a lot of power. And, and I think voting is, 
you have all these people that don't vote, and then you see 32 election results, and you say, you know, so in, in your libraries, I know you do this, but uh, do remind people that it's a good idea to vote and that kind of thing. That's that's helpful. Um, are there other questions uh, there from anyone? Um, I, I will say that it's uh, it seems like a dire time in the in the state and uh, and it is <laughs> and but at the same time from my energy reporters I hear that you might see some stabilizing I don't think you're ever going to see a lot of this revenue come back but you're going to see them have a chance to stabilize things I think they'll pa what they did in the past as far as revenue increases if it gets really bad and people bang on them at their coffee shops or, or at the grocery store and all that. It's amazing what happens, and it's just public interaction. And you see it all the time. And I, uh, I've i watched legislators who have always been opposed to something change their mind. It, it, it happens all the time, and it's simply because people have talked to them about an issue. And so if you want a Medicaid expansion passed, you know, and it's not people from around the state. You know, Eli Bebop doesn't care what I have to say. He might care more about what I have to say than some other people, but not, you know, if he doesn't care what a person from Laramie says. But if somebody in Riverton was to reach out to him, that's the people that he pays attention to. And Laramie is the same way, and, and Casper it's the same way, and Pinedale, obviously, it's the same way, too. So people will listen to you if you just bang on them. You know, if, you, if they hear from Pinedale, they'll say, all right, I'll vote for the darn thing, you know, and, and that's really important. And, and I think people do you know, underestimate their ability to get lawmakers to do what they'd like to do. So uh, let me see if we have any other questions on Twitter. Um, get that one. Uh, do I think the Cubs are going to win the World Series? Yes, <laughs> I do. Nobody actually asked that. I just thought I would comment on that. But uh, I'm, I'm excited about it. Uh, but I, I do want to just, uh, in closing, thank you. Thanks to everybody who um, you know has supported our radio station over the years. And, and it's just been so enjoyable to, you know, be part of a product that's uh, so well thought of. It's been an exciting time at Wyoming Public Radio. I think we're looking forward to um, you know a lot of exciting things in the future. Uh, as I said, we have a, a woman that is our general manager who pushes us. Uh, we're excited. Uh, one I didn't mention is we're going to put a full-time reporter up in Cody, who is going to work in conjunction. Um, I always still want to call it the Buffalo Bill Museum up there, but uh, I'm old, but uh, I just remember the old names, but working with them, and, and so we'll actually do some work with them as well as uh, a lot of cultural stories for us, uh, help our, our cultural reporter, and then also we'll continue to um, report on the national parks and join Penny Preston in doing that, and what we're hoping is that person can cover a lot more of northern Wyoming and do some really good reporting up that way, which you know, it's tough for us, especially we are in the worst possible location uh, for covering an entire state. We're in the southeast corner, and any of you in Cheyenne know how great that is to in December to drive um, you know far away and up to Gillette and that kind of thing. And so, if we had some people up in northern Wyoming, uh, that would really help out. We're working on some grant funding, uh, crossing our fingers for a reporter up in the Sheridan area as well. And so we're really trying, and, and even making the Jackson uh, position up there a, a potential full-time position in the future. So lots of possible things going. Again, this is coming from people that will help us pay for these things. And uh, boy, there's nothing more exciting than to get done with a fund drive and realize this is a service that people actually could get for free. Um, and do. Uh, I mean, just turn on the radio. You can get it. Uh, but we have people that give us uh, a lot of money to allow us to do what we do and, and it's really an honor and, and, and we take it extremely seriously and it's something that um, you know we'll, we'll continue to work hard and love to hear. Yes, you have a question. Um, I just wanted to say I love uh, Pet Wednesday. When you do Pet that. Wednesday. <laughs> I'm a big fan for Pet Wednesday. Yeah. Oh, and you and uh, Caroline Ballard. I'm a big fan of But I wonder um, what about uh, Nick Murray? Um, do you receive money from them too? We, I, 
I don't think so. I don't think we've gotten the McMurray money. That I mean, they've been underwriters uh, in the past. But I don't th not certainly not like other people have. Uh, they're, they're such big yeah. Stars. Well, and I do know April Burmer Kuntz really well. And I was uh, joking when I saw at the high altitude training center that's going to solve everything uh, for the for, for our athletic teams. Um, when I did I say that? <laughs> not that. No, um, but. I, I, I am actually, I cover athletics and I, and I enjoy athletics, but sometimes things make me smile. But uh, any, any uh, and maybe that's not the reaction that most people have had to that. But I was actually joking that maybe I should have April come down. We, we work in a basement, for those of you who don't know, and we have pipes over the top. And, <laughs> We think asbestos. We try not to think about it a lot, and, and we have a couple of windows that are up here, and so and and every now and then we've had to stop uh, recordings because we have pipes that boop boop boop. So we thought maybe we could bring April down to just look around, and you know we could use a nice new facility too if you're looking for something fun. <laughs> we'll even name it after her, but uh, did I? I don't think that's very ethical what I just said, but whatever, I, it's funny. Uh, so I'm, I'm big on funny, so we, we do that. But we've talked about bringing some of these people down and, and see what they can do for us. But uh, university kind of has a clamp on certain names, uh, and there are people you're not really supposed to talk to, and, and those two that we just talked about the examples of that. We have other bigger projects, Bob. We don't need you talking to any of those people, so who knows. But. Uh, any other questions for anyone before we close out? Uh, what, let's see. What are your opinions of the biased media claims? Um, and it must be talking about the presidential campaign. Um, yeah. How do I put this? I, I would tell you first up, I've been excited by the NPR coverage that I've heard. Uh, one of my friends, Sarah McCammon, has actually been covering the Trump campaign. We're probably going to get her on the air and just talk a little bit about what that experience has been like. Sarah McCammon is probably the most religious person in public radio. She has grown up and, and she gets attacked at these Trump rallies. Well, oh, you liberal people, this, this, and this. Where did you go to college? And then she mentions the Bible school or something that she went to in college and the, how she was raised and and uh, went through a, a very rigorous religious uh, education throughout her life, and uh, they shut up and walked the other way to go pick on CNN or somebody else. But uh, she has really brought an interesting perspective to the reporting, and, and has been able to talk to some people in the Trump, you know, supporters of Trump that have really been enlightening. But uh, do I think there's been bias? Yeah, I do. But there always is, uh, especially from the national media. Uh, I think you see more of it now because of the slates and because of the you know the right wing public the bright guards. You've got, you've got all kinds of these these um, online publications and and um, blogs and that kind of thing, which which certainly is a new dynamic that we've not seen. We didn't see it ten years ago, even to this extent, and and the public, the social media stuff is just out of control, and there's a lot of attacks on people, and and that's been it's been bad, and uh, I think that because of some of the handlers around both of the campaigns, people have had bad experiences, and so they're sticking it to them, and so you're seeing a little of that I think come out. I, the TV coverage has been not good, and I've. You know, it's but I've not been a fan of television news for a while, and uh, so we just do what we do and try and do the best job we can. But I do know that um, NPR, in particular, has been um, you know the editing that goes into it because everybody expects bias from us, and so the the editing that goes into it is has been very rigorous. I mean, and I don't. I think that I'm right about this. Trump has not done a sit-down interview with NPR. I think he's rejected requests for that, but uh, because he might get really good questions and might not want to answer them, I'm just a speculation. But uh, even Hillary Clinton hasn't done much lately, and so it's it's been a little bit of a challenge. This has been the weirdest presidential campaign I think we can all agree that we've ever seen in our lives, and uh, it's going to only get weirder. I think uh, we're all interested in what happens on election day, uh, but 
it's been hard to cover. I mean, there's some things that looks biased, but it's not. But but there certainly, I think, have been people who have chosen sides and uh, for whatever particular reason. So it it always makes you feel bad. And uh, there have been people that contribute. I just read this article. Uh, maybe some of you saw it, where there are journalists contributing to the camp presidential campaigns. Um, that's not good, and that's not what we want. And so it's. You know, I, one of the great things that's gotten me out of putting signs in my yard uh, is because we're ethically we're not supposed to do that. So uh, even you know, sorry, <laughs> go away. I don't like you anyway. But uh, I'm not putting your sign in my yard. It's a great out. Uh, it's a perfect thing you can do. You don't put somebody down there. So uh, that's kind of thing. Let's see, Cindy Moore says, "Why well, I mean, public radio rocks." Thank you for that. Um, yay for covering Northern Wyoming. Uh, that's a, a comment. Uh, any other questions from anyone? Let's see. What conversations do you have in the office about staying neutral compared to advocacy journalism? Uh, that's a good question. Uh, we we um, we don't ever talk about advocacy journalism uh, for one, but we do look for it. And uh, there are times. Yeah, you know, it's a funny world. Uh, I mean, there's there's times you have to tell the truth, and you just say, well, this is the truth, and and it might sound like advocacy journalism. Uh, we've done, we've been accused of that on some of our reservation coverage, uh, just as an example, because like, we've been the only people who have done much with the reservation recently. Uh, and something we, that was an agenda item to make sure we go up there and Melody Edwards and before her, Irina Shorov and Tristan Aton, who was a Native American, really got opened the doors for us up there. And you got to see it's, it's the violence issues are, you know, certainly against women, some of the issues are of huge concern. Um, but there's a lot of other things going on, um, you know, housing issues, health care concerns. Uh, and so we've been able to cover a lot of that. And it sometimes comes out like we're advocacy, but, but that's our, my job as an editor. And that's uh, all of our reporters actually assist in editing. I get edited just as well as, as everyone else. And uh, we work very hard at, at trying to take this, that kind of thing, make sure it's balanced as best it can be. Uh, there is not always two sides to every story. Uh, there are sometimes it's pretty blatantly this side of the story, although we would be delighted to hear what you have to say about it kind of thing. And, uh, but it's, you know, we, we do worry about uh, being fair, and that's the biggest thing we do. Some people think we're too fair sometimes, and it's, it's funny how you get those complaints. Ralph Nader called me up one time on the telephone. I had done a story for the network uh, when we were having that delightful little debate on caffeine damages on medical malpractice cases, and I was laying it out, and um, he said, that was a terrible story. And I said, why? Because cause it was balanced. It's not a balanced issue, so you can't win. Sometimes, you know, you say it's balanced. All the everybody who was for caps hated me, and everybody that was against it hated me. So I, you know, I thought sometimes you just go, well, I'm just don't have any friends. But that's the way it goes, and you have to tackle these stories. Uh, certainly, when we covered the Matthew Shepard case, uh, that's one that comes to mind. When you, you know, it was there was a lot of people pushing the media to report things certain ways. Uh, they're really what, we were being as lobbied as much as anybody. And so you have to step back and not worry about what anybody else is reporting and just say, what, what really is the story here? And uh, that's what we tried to do. And uh, every now and then there's, there's some that might push in one direction, it's pushing in another direction. But the goal is to be as fair as possible. And um, so that's you really have to watch it. But when I come on the air, just like today, you know, and, and I know there was one time I got a little pushback from legislators last year. Somebody said, um, have the budget cuts focused a lot on poorer people? Yes, they, they did. And, and I laid out the reasons why I thought that. And, uh, you know, I know Tim Stubson wasn't delighted with what I had to say, but uh, sorry, look at what you did. So sometimes those things have to be just said, and, and that's my job, is to tell you what's out there. So uh, it's not to rip them or anything like that. It's just to say, yeah, no, that, that really is happening. So sometimes it's helpful for people to know the truth, and uh, that's what I do. 
So it's uh, and trust me, I am. You know, people are always wondering what side is he on? Is he a Democrat or is he a Republican? What is he? And I'm for, I, I vote one way. I vote in the most exciting race in Albany County that year. Um, sometimes because I might know somebody or something like that, like everybody else, you know, oh, you'd like your friend to become county commissioner because maybe that'll help you. But no, I'm joking about that. But um, <laughs> sort of joking. Um, uh, but you, or or you know somebody that'd be good on the school board. You know, you, you're like that. But at the same time, um, you know, I, I don't care, and and I really focus on personalities. And for the most part, like, like the legislature, I I'd say 80 percent of them are. Very good people, maybe even 85. Very good people, and they're just doing what they see as best. And they just, it, but everybody doesn't always agree. And then so, uh, I don't think they're wrong for a particular vote always. And uh, sometimes I, I, I probably would have gone the other way, but uh, you know, that's not my job. My job is to report on things and, and report on what they did. And so that's what we try to do. One last one from anybody, because I know you have to go to the bathroom probably out there. Isn't there <laughs> treats coming uh, at some of these places? Um, I don't think we have another question. Anybody in here that has one last thought? Um, All right. If there was a certain time um, that you ever had trouble presenting the facts, or like you felt you were in such a spotlight, was there a time that I had trouble presenting the facts uh, because I couldn't get them? You or, mean? Or a difficult story? Yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm, I, will, I will tell you that the Mark Hopkinson execution that I covered. Uh, actually, I'm not a great historian, so it was either '91 or '92, somewhere around there. Uh, I remember being there on a cold night uh, in Rollins, and this is before technology, so to get the story on the air. We had to drive back from Rollins at night in a snowstorm, and that is such a delightful road to come back on <laughs> at, at uh, two in the morning. So uh, when that's all happening, and so I, I still that's burned in my memory. That was an interesting case. Um, you know, he didn't actually kill anybody himself, but there were suspicions that he, you know, ordered a slain, ordered this, all ordered that. It seems like that probably was the case. Uh, you execute a person for that. That was a very interesting story to cover. And so uh, that, that was in Jerry Spence being involved in the middle of that case. Uh, and I read his book right before I tried to interview him, and he really didn't want to talk about it too much at that time. I've actually never talked to him about it. I should probably do that uh, someday. But um, uh, we had, I would say, the Matthew Shepard one is the one that will always, um, you know, what really, 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 really happened. And, um, you know, honestly, there's only two people alive that really know, and uh, they've told us their story. And uh, I know some other people have speculated other things, people have written books about other things, but sometimes maybe you have to believe the murderers. And so that's where I come down, but do I have one strong opinion or the other? I would say that that was actually, a, a, as far as murders go, I, a little more complex than uh, than I'm smart enough to figure out. I think there was a lot going on uh, in, in that thing, and so we'll just leave it at that. But um, was somebody picked up and, and killed because they were gay? You know, maybe, maybe not. And, and it's, uh, so that's, a, that's always been a tough one for me. Um, the tough, that was a tough one, but I would say the toughest one I ever covered my life and the one that I had nightmares about and sometimes still think about were the kids that died in the, the Remember the Eight crash. Uh, when you, if you went to that crash scene, um, you're just never going to forget it. And that was uh, a thing that probably uh, led me to doing a lot of drunk driving stories and, and we did a lot of coverage on that particular issue because you realize that, you know, this isn't funny and this is bad stuff. And it maybe took that one incident uh, to maybe crystallize it, I think, for the legislature, because they finally passed some laws that they had laughed about um, for like a couple of years before that. There was there was laughter, and you know, I, I interviewed a guy um, who was a senator from uh, Newcastle, who was telling me that everybody gets drunk and runs into a telephone pole once in a while. That's just the way it goes. And this is before that incident, and. I think people had a little different viewpoint after that had happened, and so, but that was that was terrible, and uh, that's one where you and and I had actually followed those runners to the mountains 
the night before, uh, or the, that morning, actually, not the night before, but that morning, uh, the Saturday morning, and then they all died early morning of Sunday. Uh, I was taking my dogs to the mountains. They were up in the trails, and, and I, I, I knew the coaches and saw them at the bagel shop they were at before we left, and I followed their van there and, and to realize what was going to happen in less than 24 hours is pretty remarkable. And so that was one that always, and I was a cross country runner in my in my life and a track person. So that was um, that was probably the toughest one I ever covered. It's the one I, I think about the mo the one the most. And the Jessica Dubroff crash here uh, in Cheyenne, the young lady that uh, was trying to fly across the country and just died for no particular reason was was a very, that was one that was, and that just got more crazy as it went on. We interviewed her mother, and, well, she died doing what she loved. Okay, she was seven, but okay. Uh, so that was, uh, that was a difficult one too. So those are the ones that uh, certainly come to mind, but it's, it's, as far as, you know, reporting the facts and all that and trying to lay it out, sometimes it's hard because you don't always know them all and you have to take your best shot, but, um, that's it. Well, thank you very much. I am to tell you that uh, we will be closing down from here um, for a little bit, for the rest of the day. Okay, for the rest of the day. And uh, oh, I'm sorry. Well, two fifteen. The the better keynote speaker is going to be uh, talking at two fifteen. You can enjoy him. But thank you very much for having me. And uh, again, have a great day.